talk a little about who's this for. Um, this is for you if you're just starting at farmer's markets feeling overwhelmed. You're struggling to stand out in a saturated market. You want to make more sales and even sell out at market. Or you're just looking to streamline and scale your business with a proven system so you can profit from your hard work. All right, so what we're going to talk about today is first we're going to go over some of the myths about farmer's market that can keep you stuck. Um, we'll talk about how to be instantly recognizable with branding. So we'll talk about some branding. We'll talk about how to close more sales at market with some customer service um, thought reversal or like myths reversal for the actual customer. And then we're going to talk about how to streamline your workload. So we're going to talk about some of the systems we put in place to actually be able to attend four markets a week without burning out. And then we're going to talk about it also how to scale your revenue without paying for expensive ads. Because I know that's the one thing that farmers really struggle with is, uh, you know, spending money on marketing. But you don't really have to spend money on marketing. You just, as I discussed earlier, have to build that raving fan base that will actually share your information for you. All right, so you're in the wrong place. If you have no interest or ever selling at markets, if you're satisfied with your current market revenue. Is anyone here that's satisfied with their current market revenue? Nope, okay, good. <laughs> you aren't ready to try new things, or you hope everything, you'd learn everything right now. All right, so I am gonna have some resources at the end that you can grab, so make sure you stick with us to the end. And a little bit about me, um, so farmer and educator, did over a thousand farmers markets in the decade that we did markets. Um, I'm a farm coach, thriving farmer summit host, and a podcaster. And we had a farm in upstate New York called Kilpatrick Family Farm for about a decade. All right, so when we were started at Farmer's Markets, as you saw a little bit earlier, we started very basic, very small. I actually couldn't go back and find those pictures from that first year because I just don't think we even had any picture. We were so embarrassed. We never took a picture of our stand. Um, but, you know, that second year is where we really started. So I think I shared this one. This is one of the first years um, of doing winter markets. So I think this was probably about two to three years into our, our farming career. Um, but we really scaled our business to the point that um, at the Saratoga market, and let me tell you a little bit about the Saratoga market. It had, let's see, 50 vendors. It had 30 vegetable vendors. And um, we were voted number one at that market. Not one, not two, not, but three years in a row. And we took the best of market when they had the stand, um, basically the stand contest or whatever they did. So um, we knew our, stuff, our way around a farmer's market stall. But it was Erica, who right there, who took us there. Because when we started, we didn't, Erica's background um, was retail. She worked at Calvin Klein, did two of their top grossing st um, stores at the West Coast, was director of training. And she brought all that retail psychology to her farmer's market stall. I'll tell you the reason why we succeeded is, yes, we had great product, yes, we had great customer service, but we also implemented a lot of retail psychology, which helped us pull customers into our stand that normally would have walked on past. All right, so there's no accident. First, again, I said high quality products, business savvy, and we are going to talk through here and um, you know, talk about that scale through this. All right, I'm not sure why. There we go. All right, so let's talk about some myths because I know a lot of people, when I talk to people across the nation about farmer's markets, talk about, hey, you know, I just can't make money. I got to beat competition on price. Well, and that works for Walmart. But Walmart has 350,000 SKUs or different items that they sell as well as another couple hundred thousand online. Um, and you're never going to be that Walmart. You don't want to be that Walmart. We were usually the highest priced person at our market. Let me tell you a story. So at our market was another grower, um, and they had beautiful products. And actually, they were probably a better, he was a much better grower than I was, is that every single week, his products were more consistent. They were more perfect. They were more beautiful. But we always outsold him at a higher price. And he came over one day and stood there and just looked at the stand, and I went over, because we were good friends. And he's like, Michael, I just don't know how you do it. And I was like, well, it's just the marketing techniques that we use to pull people into the stall. So that one is not true. And the other one is if I would just put it on my table, it will sell and people will buy it. And I've seen some pretty pitiful stalls. And actually, when I was visiting my friend Ray just a couple weeks ago down in Tennessee, um, I was at his stall. And he, again, had his beautiful display of produce. On the other side of the market, there was someone that had taken dirty 
folding tables. They were all scratched up and really dirty and had just taken their piles of produce and just dumped them on the table. Um, and their kale was yellowing and they didn't have any signs. Which vendor do you think is going to make more money? Obviously Ray, because he has a beautiful stand even though his product is, was higher. So when you really work on the display aspect of your, or your farm, that you will sell more. Another thing that I, a lot of people, I think, misunderstand is that people already know what to do with my produce, and it's not true. People have no idea what to do with kohlrabi. Many of the times, they have no idea what to do with kale, and um, they sure don't know what to do with microgreens or anything like that. They're just like, what are these? And so your job is to educate the consumer, and there's so many easy ways to educate them. We'll get into some of those later. All right, so let's talk about the four essentials of farmer's market success. So the first four is what we base our core um, teaching around is attract. So you want to make sure you get the right people to notice you at the farmer's market. And there's going to be some merchandising around that. There's going to be telling the story. You then need to convert them. So you need to get them from just looking at your stand to now buying from you. The next goal is to build a system to allow you to scale. Because who, who here does one farmer's market a week? Who here does two farmer's markets a week? Okay, a few of you. Who here does three farmer's markets a week? Okay, doing multiple farmer's markets is a lot of work and a lot of stress. And so being able to scale with building out a team to be able to go to those markets for you and that sort of thing is great. Um, and then the fourth is scaling. So after you have built the first three, now you're set up to scale from like one tent to two tent to three tent to four tents. Um, or go to multiple markets because you've now built a team around that and that messaging which allows you to really scale that. Um, you know, and just like the one thing I think people say too, I'm not sure if I hit it on there in the myths, is that you can't make money at farmer's markets. And so I actually started doing some research last year, and I reached out to some of my friends in Pennsylvania, some of my friends on the West Coast, um, some of my friends in New York City, in Maine, some places where, yes, there's a lot of farmer's markets, but also farmer's markets are incredibly saturated. Um, like if you go to Maine, there's literally an organic farm on every single corner. Um, if you go to like Seattle, Oregon, um, California, and there are markets, farmers, that are pulling in mid five figures, thirty, forty thousand dollars a week attending four to five markets in, in New York City. Um, my friends in Maine at one market are pulling in five figures. They're doing ten thousand dollar days. So it's possible. A, you've got to have the product. B, you've got to learn how to market that. All right. So let's first talk about attract. So first is people can't buy what they don't know about. So you have to be able to merchandise. You've got to be able to share what you've got. The second thing is you need to create your funnel or your customer journey. We talked about that in the keynote a little bit earlier. Um, you also need to work on creating your story. So the story is the message you're telling, the, the feeling you give people. Um, so the feeling I give you, I'm wearing like a checkered shirt. I've got, you know, somewhat cropped hair. I'm not the... Um, dreads, I'm not a purple shirt, I'm not, you know, a, a row of purple hair down the middle. I'm not giving you off that vibe. That would be a completely different vibe and I would attract a different customer base because of that. So you need to think about that as well. And then you need to create aspect too. So let's talk about the story. What are your three points of your story? Are you spray fee free? Are you beyond organic? Um, do you use heirloom recipes when you make your jams and jellies and your baked goods? Um, has your farm, your farm been farming for multiple generations? These are all part of the story that you're telling people that buy from you. And your goal is to really wrap that into a very succinct um, statement. All right, so these are a couple of examples. So this is Biker Dude Organic Ginger. So he's like the top ginger seed producer in the U.S. He's located in Hawaii. And this is his vibe. This is his feel. So would you say that this picture looks like, you know, would be what he would look like based on that box? The box, him. You know, that's kind of, that fits with his vibe and fits with his message. Um, this is JBG Organics down in Austin, Texas. Um, you can't, it's a little dark picture, but you can kind of see the truck, how it's got a big roaster on it, and just the, the type of what they're, they're putting there on their sign. This is part of their website. So you can kind of see how they built that kind of uh, upscale hipster um, Austin vibe into that, and they've done very well. I mean, they probably, I don't know, probably a million dollars a year at least in their, their grosses. There are a lot of farmers markets, uh, large CSA, that sort of thing. 
Um, so those are two examples of kind of how they've built out their story and their vibe and their feel. So this is also memorable marketing assets. So these are some recipe cards that I picked up at a farmer's market in Chicago. Um, as you can see on the front here, these are just beautiful pictures of tomatoes. And this is something someone actually might even frame on their wall. Um, but these are recipe cards. So the back side of them, and I don't have a picture of those, but the back side of them contained information about the farm and about you know, the recipe for that. This is something someone would take home and stick on their fridge. And that's where you want to be because that's the key of your customers. All right, so if you notice here, how did we put our brand? What was our brand? We had on our logo, on our fresh egg sign, our logo on our logo on our CSA member shirts, our logo, obviously, and our different um, assets on our different other shirts for our, our team as well. Now, what we did to make sure that our CSA members would wear their shirts at the farmer's market because th these are walking billboards for your brand at your farmer's market is we would give them a free CSA item if they wore their CSA shirt and eventually we moved to bags because some people were coming just from work and they didn't want to carry, you know, put the shirt on at the farmer's market. Um, but that was basically, so when they were shopping the entire farmer's market, they were wearing a billboard for us at other vendor stands. And so they might be at the competition, but they're wearing our logo in there. And you're gonna, people are going to ask the customers, oh, do they have good quality product? Or should I join their CSA? And obviously, these are probably our raving fans because they're buying into our most expensive product on our farm. So what's your end goal, too? So for us, it was moving everybody to that CSA box, the buy the CSA box. Um, for you... It may be you're just trying to increase your sales at the farmer's market. For you, it may be you just want to move them from the farmer's market to buy your CSA. It may be to move them from the farmer's market to your online store or retail location. Or it may be to move solely to farmer's market's location. Because you don't have to continue with farmer's markets. I know this is a farmer's market conference, um, but there are other sales avenues you may be pushing your members or your customers to. All right. So again, we talked customer journey earlier. You don't need to go over that. Um, but again, our goal is to figure out where we can increase the sale value of the products that they're buying from us. Kind of move them along that customer journey. Um, we talked a little bit about Ray here. And you know, we talked to. Um, I know that there's a farmers market right in right in Oklahoma City, which decided well, we're just going to shut down. We're just going to move to a different location. So. You need to be careful that your farmer's market might just up and close. Um, there was a couple farmer's markets in Indiana that did that last year. Um, there were some political things going on and stuff, and so they just shut down. And if you don't have a secondary sales outlet for your farmer's market crops, where are you? If you don't have a customer list, where are you? So your goal is to make sure that you've got that email list, that you are having a second where for them to go to. All right, so the second part is the convert. So first, we talked about the attract. We need to get people into your stand. We've got to have the right story. We've got to have the brand assets. We've got to have the, the value ladder that they can climb as they work with you. Next thing is to actually make your stand work for you and convert people to actually paying customers. So that's having a good, beautiful display. That is customer service is key. That is... People love a great promo and a great, um, so basically sharing your product with them, either like a, a deal at the market, so like a, a two for seven or a three for ten, so you want to get them to buy multiples, um, or allowing people to try before they buy with a sample. So why do you think if you go to, let's say, someplace like New Orleans or Chicago or let, some of those big touristy places, they always have people on the sidewalk holding trays of samples for the products in the stores because it drives people in. It works. That little sample, which costs them 10 cents or 12 cents, will result in a, can result in a 4 to $5 sale inside the store. So that's why they do it, and I highly encourage you to figure out how to do that. Now, depending on your state, they have different rules on what they can do for samples and cannot, so you need to look at your local laws, make sure you're following those. Um, but you, there's definitely try to figure out ways to do that. So let's talk about the attractive display first. First, you've got the first look. So this is kind of like someone's walking by, and you realize people have a three-second attention span. So if they're walking by your stand, they've got usually three to four seconds of just seeing what's going on before they're going to be on to the next booth. So you've got to figure out, standing back from your stand, and we would do this. We built the entire display out, and then I would walk across the aisle and kind of look at it. 
I'd also watch customers interact with it, too, to kind of see what the customer flow was. Um, but I was always looking at what that first look was. So right here, what's the first look? Is the pile of beautiful broccoli, the pile of radishes, and a nice sign which shows where it is, tells what, what kind of our certification is, and our website. So it's really easy for them to kind of get the legitimacy of that business. All right, so we got that first look. We got the flow. So you want to make sure there's good customer flow through that. You don't want bottlenecks. You want to make sure you've got good hot corners. So we call in farmers markets these as hot corners. So basically, where people's eyes are drawn in a display. And if you go into, let's say, um, J.C. Penney, or if you go into, let's say, like a Macy's, those kind of stores, they do a lot of this kind of merchandising where they focus on hot corners or like the customer flow to, to kind of move you through how you're going to shop with them. Uh, make sure you're using all your space. Um, so my friend Ray, again, he's used to spreading out. They used to give him like three stalls. Well, the new farmer's market he was, they gave him one 10-foot stall. So he had to go vertical. And so he literally built a display four to five feet high so he could display all that products. Um, so when we first started off, they gave us a very small space as well. So again, going vertical and going vertical, people shop. Let me see if I have this. Actually, I think it's one of the next slides. Um, people shop from the knees to the eye level. So you also want to make sure you fill that space as well. Colors too. Colors are important. You obviously don't want to have clashing colors. Um, you want to have a good mix of colors for your stall. So right here, first look, you can see here, farm banner at the top. You want your table here. I do not recommend them putting a farm banner here. Guess why? People block it. Boom. Yes, exactly. People block it. Um, so secondary banner, I like to have a secondary banner inside your stall that kind of pull people in that want to read a little bit more about you. You can hang things. If you can hang things, let's say you do garlic or some of those other things, you could hang, hang things because that attracts attention as well. Let's go through this here. Check out space. You want to have a purse space. You always want to make sure that you've got space for people to set down their purses because um, that increased buy, buying power. Because people will only shop to their hands are full. And if they have someplace to put their purse, that means they can pick up something else. All right? Clean, organized, beautiful. You can see here, just a little bit of an example, we're using different heights. We're using special promo signage. We're using different size, different shapes, different color containers. Um, simple grab and go as well. So you also want to make it convenient to buy. When we got to our farmer's market, there were two vendors that were doing salad mix by the bin. So basically, people would have like these bins lined up and people would have tongs and they'd go along and fill up their things. But what we realized is that person looked like they were selling hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds. But because it took so long for people to fill their bags, that they were actually selling a lot less than we were, and we had all our big, big piles of grab and go. Um, here's the Great Wall. This is out in the, um, I think in the Seattle market. And you can see here, this is, um, I can't see the name of the farm there, but it's in there. Uh, but this is one of the main farmers out there. But you can see how they've got knees to eye level. I would love to see that a little fuller. So you've got some half-empty containers here. I'd love to see that all the way full. And that would increase sales. All right, so here is a meat stall. And I know meat is a challenging thing to sell at farmer's market. Um, so we actually have gone into deep this a little bit. We actually went to a bunch of farmer's market, looked at what like, the best practices were. Um, this is actually a friend of mine, Jordan, and in, in, um, he's in Virginia. And they did farmer's markets for years. But they did so well at farmer's markets, and they did so well driving traffic off of farmer's markets. Now all they do is home delivery, and they have a retail store on their farm, and they ship nationwide now. So they completely cut out farmer's markets, but the reason they were able to is they had a beautiful display, pulled people in. Um, in this, this right here, they were selling sandwiches, so they would make like sausage, sam sausage egg, um, cheese sandwiches, and that was the aroma pulling people in. Because the one nice thing that meat vendors have is the smell attraction, is that vegetables, you really can't cook a lot of vegetables and they smell really good, but meat, you can sure pull people in. Um, a couple other cool things of merchandise. You can see this is a honey farm. You can tell that instantly. They have a, a display that's shaped like a honeycomb. And this is a chocolate, a high-end chocolate. They've got cacao um, pods here. And then they've got the chocolate displayed under glass to give it an illusion of, you know, expensivity. And uh, the samples are back there so that you're not going to contaminate them by, like, sneezing on them. Whoops. All right, so signage. My pet peeve at any farmer's market 
is the see if a vendor not use signage. I will tell you, it kills your sales every single time. Because I shop at farmer's markets every single week, and I want to be able to see the price sign, or I usually won't approach the stand. Because then it makes that awkward thing of how much is that product, and they say, well, it's $4, and they're like, well, I don't really want to spend $4 on that, and then, they, then it just, that's a whole awkward interaction, and people hate things that are awkward. One thing I didn't talk on, but I'm going to share here is, did you know that in the industry, there is a term called butt brush? That's the aspect of you have to make sure your aisles are wide enough that when two people are standing there, they do not brush, brush their butts. Because that is a psychological trigger, and it will make them stop buying. And that's proven through years of retail psychology. Um, he wrote a couple books called, uh, I think he called one called What Women Want, and that's basically about women shopping. And then Why We Buy was another one on retail psychology. So these are the kind of the, the textbooks if you want to do retail psychology, and we just brought those into our farmer's market stand. All right, talk about high converting price signs. So you've got here the name of the product. You've got a little bit about it. Um, so what you want to do in the about is you have two purposes. One, to describe what it is. Two, to tell you what to do with it. So it's a green with a little bit of a zip, and it's great in salads and sandwiches. Why? Because people look at a, a daikon radish and they're like, that's weird, and they don't want to know what it is, and they don't want to be embarrassed by asking you about it, so you want to clearly identify what it is. You also see we've got the clear price sign and a clear unit. It's a $4 per bag, as well as brand right here, because brand always gives authority, as well as we had a CSA, and our CSA picked up off our farmer's market stand, and so we wanted to tell them how much was in that CSA um, unit. All right. So, objections are another thing that always come up at farmer's markets as well. And so, people ask things like, you know, the price seems awfully high, or did you grow this yourself? I mean, incredulously, you're like, did you grow this yourself? I've had that more than once. Um, and the other thing, like, you know, who's the real farmer? I mean, I do look like I'm 12, but. Um, <laughs> so, the other thing is, are you local? That's another one that comes up. So, what we love to say, like, we price our items based on several factors, including quality. If you try our products, and don't think they're excellent, we'll give you double the money back. We had this policy, and guess how much we paid out over a decade? Less than 100 bucks for a decade. So I mean, yes, it pays for itself. Um, and I think a lot of that was just like, they actually got bad product, and we were super embarrassed anyway. Um, and so we usually just replace them with new product. Um, the worst situation we had was there's a type of road cover you can buy that when it freezes, it freezes to the crop and actually leaves like plastic hairs in the crop. And someone had bought like five pounds of broccoli for us for their Thanksgiving meal and for the, all their like family and got plastic filaments in their broccoli. We felt like awful after that because not only had we w ruined their meal, all their friends now had come and eaten our broccoli that had plastic in it. So. Um, yeah, that was probably 50% of that $100 we, 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 uh, we funded. Um, and then obviously the one, did you grow to make this yourself? And then obviously an easy one is, I sure do. I love this work or something like that. Um, and then are you local? It's obviously really easy to have that on your sign or on your signage. But people will still ask. Um, you know, people do not read these days. And so you're always going to have to repeat your signage even if it's right in front of them. All right. All right, so the third part is the build. And how are we doing on time here? Are we doing okay? I'm only 25 minutes in. Okay, good, cool. So the first part is to research the local farmer's markets. And so when we were, we, again, I told you the story earlier about starting at that curbside market in a local store, a local general store, which their top two sellers were cigarettes and beer, and try to have a market there. And that really wasn't that effective. We didn't make that much money there because it was the wrong market for us. So what you want to do is do the research. You want to do all the local farmers markets. And actually, myself, I've been doing this locally in our area. We did this last summer. We went to all the farmers markets and we kind of started looking at who's there, what they were offering, what the price points were, um, what were the type of ven uh, vendors and the type of customers. Were they older? Were they younger? Did they have kids? Did they look like they were more affluent? Were they less affluent? What were in their zip code around there was like the, the, the average income, average um, house value. Because these are all things that are going to see if it's the right market fit for you. Now, um, and it, it depends on what type of things you're selling. They might be a good fit or not. So you definitely want to do your research first. 
Um, and I think I'm going to get to that a little bit later. So I want to come back to that. The second part is to make sure you're getting to market and getting set up, make it simple. So I know you guys here in Oklahoma City used to have an indoor farmer's market where you could actually like save your displays and then just put your product on them. Oh my gosh, that would have been amazing. At most of our markets, we had to haul everything in. We had to haul into the displays and the tables and the tents. Um, we had a 14 foot truck and a third of that truck was just supplies for the market. Because um, we set up a 16 by 30 foot booth, so it was a rather large booth. Um, so we want to make that super simple. So we laid out our truck, you know, every single week we'd figure out, you know, can we put wheels on that? Can we make this simpler? And the other thing is, you've got wind, so if you have tents and stuff, you have to make sure you keep that, help hold that down. Um, so there can be a lot of challenges around that. Um, so for vehicles, you know, maybe you're starting with your a van. I really love vans compared to uh, pickup trucks because I think they're so much more versatile and they're already enclosed. And usually the more, the, the vans now have like flat fold seats or you can just take all the seats out and use it my way as a little pickup truck. Um, so I, and you can air condition that compared to like a pickup truck has an open bed. Even if you put a cap on that, that bed area can get super hot. Um, so figuring out that right thing. Maybe you're going to do a trailer. And we love to see insulated trailers as well, maybe with a cool butt, maybe without, depending on the distance you have to go. Um, and then the hiring and training. So after you've got your right market, to make sure you get the right tools to get to the market, and then hiring and training effectively. We've worked with a lot of people at the farmer's markets, and we find that when they can start hiring people and adding to their team, especially people that know, like, and trust their brand, they are actually better promoters than a lot of farmers. Because I know a lot of people get into farming because they love the soil. I tend to find that I find more introverts get into farming for some reason than extroverts. Um, and this is, this is a funny story. At our market in Saratoga, there was a vendor that was there way before us. They were kind of one of the OGs of the market. And they had their 10-foot spot. They were the only, one of the only certified organic people there. And I found out by talking to somebody else that they did a third of the sales that we did. And they had been there way longer than us and had beautiful display. The reason is they had someone sitting behind their stand like this, the entire market. You know, just frowning, looking at their phone. Or this was, you know, a number of years ago. So maybe they're looking at their newspaper. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was not going to get them good sales. If someone's not approachable, people aren't going to approach the stand. So this third party who told me this story said she recommended to them that they change out the person behind the stall. Well, guess what happened? When they had a smiling, happy person behind the stall, their sales doubled in just one week. Because the thing about Saratoga Market is there was 3,000 people that came through that a day. It had very high traffic. You just needed to be approachable and pull people into your stand. So thinking if you, can, if you aren't someone who naturally just is effervescent and loves to talk to people, Maybe what you need is someone you can partner with, one of your raving fans, that's actually going to be a much better salesperson behind the table than you are. Um, I know on our stand, we would hire those people, um, our CSA members and people who loved us, um, and that can be also be a very effective way. And then the other thing is to keep excellent track records of your stall, you know, your profits, and um, like when you sell out of things so you can make sure you bring the right amount of product. Because here's the problem with the farmer's market. And let's say, unless like a grocery store or CSA where you can say, the grocery store wants six cases of lettuce. Or the CSA, I'm picking 25 of each item for 25 members. Farmer's market, you go and you put the stuff on the table and you hope it sells. I mean, obviously you can look at track record, but you don't want to pick twice the amount of product that you're going to sell because that is all wasted product that's very expensive compost. And so what you want to focus on is how close can you get to that magic number where you bring enough to fill the table right to the end of the market, but it sells out before you have to take it home. Um, so again, that's where you really want to make sure you keep those good records. All right, so again, what's the market for you? We really favor producer only. I know those are tough to find in some places, but all the markets we attended were producer only. Um, there are definitely some ways that you can leverage being a a grower at a, a buy-in market, um, and you can own both of it. I, we have people that actually buy in some stuff, um, and I'm completely fine with that as long as they just, you know, are transparent about that. What I don't like to see is growers that claim they grow stuff and it's from the local um, auction. That, that drives me nuts. Again, the demographic, we talked about that. Um, the size, does it have enough people coming to that market to make it worthwhile? You know, if it's a, a town of maybe 2,000 or 1,000 that has literally 75 to 100 people show up, 
it might not be the right market. But it could be too, because I've seen some really small markets that have a very highly engaged market population. Um, they buy big amounts because it's like the only place in town. So you just have to look at that. But that's going to definitely be part of your calculations. Parking. To me, parking is one of the killers of a market. And in Saratoga, that was actually the case, is the reason we actually moved to doing other markets in the area, and actually our sales at that market dropped rapidly, is the parking halved and then quartered. And literally, the opening bell at 9 o'clock, the entire street would be completely full. There was no parking left. And so people had to walk like a quarter mile or a half a mile to get to that market because there was such a busy downtown. Um, so if you don't have parking, that's going to really limit your sales. Covered versus open, there's advantages to each. Um, for like if you've got covered but you've got lights in there, that's great. But if it's covered without like and it's not lighted and it doesn't have like um, translucent windows in the top, if it's cloudy, it can get really super dark. People can't see your product. Um, so you definitely, maybe you can bring in some battery-operated LED lights or something and clip them over your stand. I've definitely seen that. And then distance from the farm. Um, you know, we were in upstate New York. We were four and a half hours from New York City. And we had probably six to 12 farms just in our area that actually did the four and a half hour drive down to New York City. And some of them would go down on a Saturday, do two markets, spend the night in New York City, do a Sunday market, and then drive home Sunday night. And that was their re weekly ritual because they were doing 10 grand in those two days. So um, compared to our local markets, which are a lot more saturated. So definitely you have to do the cost benefit analysis on that. And then what vendors are at the markets too. So we like to see the 60, 20, 20 mix where it's a 60% meat farmers or in vegetable farmers. So basically producers, 20% um, like you can have some arts and crafts and kind of more fun things. And then more of a 20% um, prepared foods. We really like to see that prepared foods, food trucks, that sort of thing. We do feel that bowls people in. It really brings out that community aspect, um, the music and that kind of thing. Let's see what else we got. So here we are loaded and ready to go. You can see right there loaded right to the tailgate. Um, the one thing you can see, these are Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts don't pack very well because the stalks are so long. Now, what I want to point out here is see this custom built for all our market supplies. So we had our tarp up there, we had our poles to build our tent, we had our, um, our boards for our tables, we had our, our ramp, because this was a high truck, so we had a ramp and we would usually have a, a, um, a truck or two, like a, a, a hand truck, and then on this side we would have our regular tables over here, you just can't see them behind here. But again, all set up, all tied right into the truck, so that was really easy to deploy after we got to the market. Again, build those systems. So set up procedures. I'm just going to walk you through this kind of fast. Don't want to get into this too deep. But we actually, because we were hiring people, we had a very specific way that they were to set up that stand. I mean, this, was, this is what they had to follow. This was the procedure. This is the second part of the procedure. Again, so those are, going back through that, those are, those are the exact steps we took. Because again, after doing, as we said, a thousand farmers markets, we knew exactly where people were wasting steps and setting up their stands. And again, if you're just setting up a small eight foot stall, that's not as important. But even at that, I bet you could cut off five or 10 minutes of that setup by really thinking through how you're moving and where you're taking wasted steps. All right, hiring the right people. Raving fan customers are absolutely the best way. Um, we actually had a local college um, in Saratoga, which we actually were able to hire from. There were some good people there. Um, you're asking people for recommendations. You know, your best customers say, hey, you know, we're looking for some people behind the stall. Do you or someone you know, do you think they'd be a good fit? And th here's how you hire them without making anyone feel bad, is you say, hey, we need someone for just, you know, once or twice. And if they come once or twice and they're great, you're like, well, we want you every week now. Um, but they're not good, you just like, okay, next person, try somebody else. Um, you know, it's the ultimate way of never having to say you're fired. <laughs> um, so also local service organizations and online job posts. Eventually, we were looking for enough people that we actually put out some on like Craigslist and that sort of thing. So things to consider when hiring. Um, consider first what you're hiring for. Now at a farmer's market, there's actually four different roles you could be hiring for. 
For one, it could be a stalker, someone just to stalk the stand. The second one could be someone to actually interface with customers. The third is someone more of a shift manager. And the fourth would be like the actual market manager who's like managing your entire market presence. Um, always be proactive too. If you're hiring someone at the last minute, like you're swamped, you're like, oh my gosh, we have to have someone that's when you're gonna make bad hiring decisions. So we like to see, you know, before you get that busy, that start putting out feelers, start getting to someone to work a couple hours if they're already picking up vegetables. Always check your local hiring laws, and then, oh, be careful. I've seen some people look for, I'm looking for this very specific thing, and like, that is completely 100% illegal what you just said there. So you have to be careful about that. And then how long will you need someone for? Now, we talked a little bit about the numbers, knowing what it costs. Every farm is going to be different. You need to work, know what works for you. And it may be what works for you. It doesn't work for the, someone who looks like they have the exact same business. Um, so one of the things we as a company are stress is that there's no one size fits all. Um, you know, we see a lot of people out there in the online farming space say, well, this is exactly how you're supposed to set your farm up. You know, you do this, 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 and this. And I'm like... I am not going to pigeonhole anyone. I'm going to say, you know, there's a lot of ways to do it. What we teach is the business principles that help you run a successful farm business, and how you decide to grow that is going to be the way you decide to grow that. So let's talk a little bit about the, um, the market and the numbers. So um, we actually have a calculator we put together last year for this. This is part of kind of what we did, and what we threw out is, you know, if you get a four-hour market located 40 miles away, or you've got a three-hour market located 10 miles away, that makes you know, X amount of money versus Y. The further market, which actually takes more money to drive to, um, more time, more expense, if it sells a lot more product, can actually be a lot actually more economical to go to. Because I see a major thing that people tell me is like, well, I'm gonna go to the one 10 miles away because it's the close one. And I'm like, it doesn't matter how close or far it is. Um, I know people that traveled six to seven hours to go to the New York City farmers markets because that's what made their business work. Um, especially if you're out in the western part of New York State, the Finger Lakes and beyond, that is very rural. There's not a lot of um, economy happening out there and New York City was where it was happening. Um, it was incredible to go to the farmers markets in New York City and see the quality of the product that people would sell. You would see carrots that were shriveled up that had uh, mouse bites on them going for $2 a pound, and they would be sold out. Ew. Anyway, again, think about, you know, if the local markets aren't doing it for you, think about where else can I go and, and try to make it work. All right. So last one is scale. So this is after you have first attracted the right people, converted them, built the right systems, and now you're going to scale your market because now you have the proven model that's going to work. So for us, we want to build those raving fans. The best way to build those raving fans, give a lot of value, and go the extra mile then you want to incentivize them to create it, to share your message. Obviously, if they're raving shans, they will share your message, but you want to make it easy for them to share, and you want to give them a clear message to say. Because it's one thing to say, oh, you know, I know this farm, and they have this program, and you can sign up and get vegetables, compared to, oh, here's a card that explains exactly how to get um, involved in their community agricultural program and on that card it's got a QR code which leads to a video and it has them explain the entire thing for you and I love this farm which one do you think is going to convert better so you want to give your your people tools to share your message collaborate with others um, you want to collaborate with local people there's other vendors you can collaborate with restaurants shops and bloggers and then really focus on building that community around your farm as well. So again, homework, start collecting emails at your farmer's market, and I will give you a QR code you can scan at the end, and grab that. All right, so first is earn that love. So we said, you know, kind of incentive, uh, kind of get them to become a raving fan. Educate your customers. We talked about it earlier. We have, I think now, like a, a recipe collection of like 25 cards that we give to the folks in our, our program that they can actually print out well, they can, they, they're Canva templates, so they have them in Canva, they can just customize them, then they can just slap their farm name on them, print them out to their customers. Um, and then for, second thing is really capture that love. So you want to try to get testimonials about the, the conference. So I noticed out here they've got this big display where they've got like the logo for the Farmers Market Association, and they're trying to get people to stand in front of it and talk about the conference on video. 
Well, what are they doing? They're getting testimonials. If you go to any of our, our websites or pages in our business, you will see it's littered with customer proof because we know that people trust recommendations from other people. And so that's why we do it. So you want to try to get that from your customers as well. And part of that is going to be, if you have raving fans of the farmer's market, just grab your phone and say, hey, let's talk about selfie style, about why you love our farm. People are much more willing to do it selfie style than just holding the phone in their face. That freaks them out. They're doing it with someone. It's a lot easier. Um, get written reviews. Put those on your website. Put them in your newsletters and your email new newsletters. Um, and they will do the advertising for you. And then the third is that share that love. So strengthen the relationships with the community. We love to see farmers work with local bloggers, with local people in the food scene, with restaurants, and try to collaborate. And maybe a restaurant does not give you the price you need to make a profit. But what a restaurant will do is say, hey, I've got an extra 100 pounds of carrots. I want you to do a special on your menu, feature our farm with the carrots. What is that? That's brand recognition. That's people seeing you as a farm there. So that's definitely going to pull in more people for you. All right, so the next thing is, let's see what else we got here. Oh, I think it's just more of the recap. So, and we are going to have about eight minutes for questions, so I'm going to keep powering through. First, we talked about attracting people to your market stand. The second is converting people to turn them into paying customers. The third part is going to be build that farmer's market system that's going to simplify your life, allow you to scale, allow to bring people in to your market booth, um, and also to bring those employees in so you're not there every single week. You know, after doing markets for eight years, I stopped going to markets every single week, and we just had our team do it. And that was incredibly freeing, and it also allowed me to prevent the burnout that happens in August. You know, I heard from one of my friends up in Vermont. They said, yeah, we call it angry August, because that's when everyone starts fighting with each other on the farm. <laughs> I was like, that's not good, but I totally get that. <laughs> that's happened to me before. And then you've got scale. So really scaling it, working with the people in your community, um, figuring out what organizations like local food um, uh, documentary screen screenings. So there's a film out right now, the, the Biggest Little Farm. Has anyone seen that? It's excellent. It's if you haven't seen it, go watch it. I forget where it is. Maybe it's coming to Netflix soon. Um, I think that's the right name, The Biggest Little Farm or something like that. Um, it's this beautiful story, and it's shot in cinematic uh, National Geographic style. I mean, just absolutely stunning photography. Um, it's just worth, worth watching it for that aspect of things. But it's a story about a farm in California that tried, tried, tried again, and finally had success in what they were trying to do. Um, and it's a great documentary to get into your community and then have a, a panel of farmers there to talk about that and just share the local food story. So that's definitely something you can do to connect with your community and get other people involved with your local film forum. Also talk to the organic daycares. I mean, there is a, such a thing as an organic daycare out there. I just learned that last year. But it's basically a daycare that only serves organic foods, only uses organic cleaning products, and maybe they only read organic books. I'm not sure about that one. Um, all right, so right here, go to that, scan that with your phone. If you use your camera app, it should automatically take you there. And we got our ebook there. We got some resources for you um, that you can just download and grab. Um, to help you grow your farmer's market booth. All right, so we've got about five minutes for questions. Anything I can answer? Yes? Yep. Yeah. Um, so actually, that's one of the trainings Eric and I do is like 10 ways to get more people to your stand. Um, but I will tell you the top ones is if you first know exactly who the pe person is you're looking for, it's a heck of a lot easier to go find out where they are. Um, so the other thing is because it's a small market, vendors don't want to go because they're going to not have as many sales. And it's this, it's this chicken and the egg thing is like without little sales, you know, so it's back and forth. Um, I would recommend if you can go to the, get some USDA grants or something like that for promotion. I know there's some out there. I was talking to the um, person, one of the people here was presenting on a grant workshop yesterday. There are grants you can definitely get for that. Um, who can you partner with in the community? Um, can you partner with some of like the library or some of these community organizations to start putting the word out there, but also make it like an event? So the more events you can do, the more people are more willing to come to an event and they might not be willing to just come to a farmer's market. 
Um, if you can get local chefs, involve them in like some chef demos and that kind of thing. Um, also, we do recommend having some sort of market manager for that. And we like recommend having a, farmers, a manager for the farmer's market. It may be an unpaid or paid person, but you definitely need someone that's there. And we recommend it not be a vendor um, because I've been, I was in the Saratoga scene for a decade, and there was definitely politics that go along with every single farmer's market. And when you have a non-vendor as the market manager, that removes a lot of those politics from that. It doesn't come with a lot of favoritism. So we found out that worked. It may not be possible. That's just something we found out that does work. Um, and then talk about, too, um, you know, where, your, where your ideal customer is. We find you know, the daycares, the uh, gyms, the, um, even the rotary clubs. Because again, to me, the people that go to farmer's markets, there's a couple different demographics. But you've got the older clientele, which remembers the taste that they used to get, and they can't get that at the grocery store anymore. You got the second demographic is just people that want to eat healthy, and they don't care what it spends. Um, our ideal client, or ICA at our farmer's market, they were 50, they, both people worked the job, or 50 or 55, the kids were almost or out of the house, so they now had more expendable income, um, and they just you know, liked, liked local food and like we're a foodie aspect. And then the third big ICA we see for most people is the young mom, which is really concerned about what her kids eat. In fact, she will shop at the farmer's market and feed that food to her their kids, and she'll eat the food from the grocery store, which is actually troubling to me that she would do that, but I have seen that happen before. Yes? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, so again, we were what we would call, um, we were a large vendor, so we had um, usually anywhere from 20 to 35 crops on the table. So obviously we had a wide range. Now, I would not recommend starting there. I'd recommend starting with what your, your customers want. So you may start with a little bit wider and then quickly narrow down the things that aren't selling as well and um, then start building back up after you get that core mix. And I'll tell you the top five that I see time and time again is salad mix, spinach, carrots, radishes, um, microgreens, tomatoes, and cucumbers. People want to eat salad because they have been programmed by years and years of media is that salad is good for you. So even if they are going to coat it with dressing, which is not necessarily good for them, they're going to buy those core crops. Um, now, I'm not saying you can't make money on things like potatoes and squash, because we definitely did, but they're just the ROI is not as good on that. But getting back to your question about the average sale value, I would say we definitely had the people coming in for $7 that were buying two bags of lettuce. That was probably our average lower end sale. And then I would say our average price was probably $10 to $12. But you're not counting the CSA, because we did have CSAs pick up at our stand. And so our, our sales was split into three big categories. Farmers markets, which was about 40 to 45%. CSA, which was another 40 to 45%. And then wholesale at the end was at 20% but until that point was usually at 10%. And so um, obviously those CSA people, the, the cheapest CSA we had I think was $250, and then it went up to $1,200 for basically they could buy the entire year, which was 52 weeks of vegetables. So those were paying us $25 to $30 a week, and those are the customers you want. Yes? Yep. And, and market it as a trial yep. would it be better to offer at the low end or a standard price? I would always offer it at standard price. Um, you never want them to think that it's a... Uh... So what we did, we did that in a couple different ways, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, it's not supposed to be a CSA talk, but it's, it's a marketing talk, and I love marketing. So what we did is we actually offered you could buy a CSA for a week. You could pay the, average, the price, and you could pick up and try it. Try it for a week. We also, on the flip side of that, we gave away free for a month to um, mili uh, military vets and new moms. Because one of the things, if you notice, that and there was a study that came out a couple years ago with the whole Big Brother marketing thing, which we're all like used to now, of just Facebook stacking or every move, is that... Uh, I forget where the article was, but it was a father who found out his daughter was getting targeted with all these ads for a new mom. 
And the, the father was incensed. He's like, my daughter's not pregnant. Well, it turns out she was. And the marketers knew before he knew because of tracking online activity. But what we, they also shared in that article is that when someone goes through a big life change, they're more likely to make new habits. So having a baby, getting married, moving, changing jobs, getting divorced are all key times to go after a consumer because that's when you can make some big changes in their life and they're more willing to try something new. And a CSA is an actual large change because that's you know, dealing with vegetables every single week. Um, and so actually, you know, um, I'm actually going to recommend this to Meredith, but the speaker you should have keynote next year should be Karina, who talks all about CSA, but also digital marketing as well. Um, she's fabulous, and if you want to think about CSA, check in her group. I think it's like CSA discussion or something on Facebook. She's got a ton of great ideas.